we pay our respects to the traditional custodians of the land, the Bunwarung people of the Kula Nation, and their elders past, present, and emerging. Thank you for joining us for this commemoration of Yom HaShoah, the day when we dedicate ourselves to preserving the memory of the Holocaust and ensuring its transmission to the next generation. Please rise for the singing of Advance Australia Fair. Scopus community, we are gathered here today for Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. On this day, we remember the tragedy that befell millions during World War II. Given the enormity of remembering the entire story of the Shoah each year on this day, we traditionally focus on one thing that is an integral part of our people's history. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II and the liberation of the camps. Our assembly will be focusing on the liberation of Auschwitz. As ihr wet Kinderlach El Tevern, wet ihr Alain Farstein. When, dear children, you grow older, you will understand for yourselves. Our chronicle begins with the story of the liberation of the camps by the Allied forces. Though fighting still raged in the Pacific theater, World War II in Europe officially ended with Germany's unconditional surrender on May 8, 1945. Allied armed forces advanced across Europe in the war's final stages, relentlessly pursuing the retreating German army. As they did, they stumbled onto camps, often accidentally, that had been established and run by the Nazis and their local collaborators. The Soviet army, advancing from the east, liberated Nazi camps in Poland, including Majdanek and Auschwitz. The British and Canadians, advancing from the west, liberated Bergen-Belsen and camps in northern Germany. The Americans liberated Dachau, Buchenwald and other camps. Today we recognize the complexities of liberation, the shock of the Allied troops at what they saw, and the mix of joy and deep grief of the rescued survivors. Towards the end of World War II, advancing Allied forces from the East and West began discovering firsthand the horrendous scope of Nazi atrocities. Hundreds of concentration and extermination camps in which prisoners had been murdered and abused. On January 27, 1945, Soviet troops entered the Auschwitz-Birkenau extermination camp, the last extermination center still functioning under the Nazis. They found 7,650 emaciated and very sick survivors. Some 1.5 million people were murdered there, including 960,000 Jews. Auschwitz was a gigantic complex of three main camps and dozens of smaller camps located in Poland. The original camp at Auschwitz was a concentration camp called Auschwitz I. Auschwitz II was a death camp called Birkenau. Auschwitz III was a slave labor camp. Names such as Birkenau, Buchenwald, and Dachau have been eternally seared into our hearts and minds. 
These very names conjure up unspeakable and indescribable horrors. Auschwitz Birkenau has become the symbol of a Holocaust and a willful, radical evil in our time. Holocaust survivor Eva Slonim is a remarkable and inspiring woman. She is a testament to the human capacity for the preservation of morality under the most extreme circumstances. This testimony is from a few years ago, but even until today, Eva is committed to educate about the Holocaust and keep alive the memories of those who perished. And I, I think the Russians came, yes, the Russians came. You, you to Birkenau, you? yes, to Birkenau. And uh, they were there for about three days. And during that time, the people that were able to raid the food chambers. What was your reaction when they first came or when you first realised that uh, you were... Did you feel liberated? Did you feel safe? Um, no, i tell you why. They came in like... They, they looked to me like savages. They, they, were, they were still fighting, and they were in uniforms, and they had these fur caps on, and they, they, they didn't have time to give us any warmth, okay, because I found out later, because they were still fighting. They just came in. We were liberated for three days, or maybe less, or maybe more. I don't remember exactly, for a little while, what, during which time I was in bed and, and totally, totally sick, and the others, those that could raid the chambers, and then the Germans came back. So the Russians were still in a fighting mode, they weren't in a rescuers mode yet. We knew something, and we knew we were liberated, we knew the gates were open, but we couldn't get out. Because, because the streets were still, had Germans there, or whatever, we knew we couldn't leave the camp and nobody can take us out yet. Then to our horror, the Germans came back. Uh, the Russians disappeared and they, uh, they made everybody line up, even those that could and could not. And uh, we had to line up and uh, anybody that stole, you know, it was called, um, I forgot the concentration came word, organized. Organization means to, s to steal mm -hmm. food or clothing. If you had new clothing on you, you, you carried something with you, it was shot straight away, and, you know. So we, we just, uh, you, because they saw that we'd already rained, they had already raided the chambers. So Martha and I, we tried to walk in the middle so that we wouldn't be the most conspicuous people for the sh in, within shoot, the most os obvious shooting range. Next to me was a young boy with whom I, uh, with whom I, a young boy who had a very, he was whom I was in hospital, who had a very big wound in his leg, the bottom of his leg. And uh, I didn't think he would be able to walk one step, but he did. He walked all the way. And uh, I think I never saw him afterwards. And then uh, um, then we arrived between Birkenau and Auschwitz. There were two, three kilometers. We arrived in Auschwitz all the time, uh, marching and, and people being shot on the way. And then uh, we were taken into a very big barrack. and. Uh, we were told we're not allowed to come out, get out of there, and we heard shooting in the streets, and we heard shooting, and, and we heard shooting everywhere actually. And then I looked out the window. You weren't allowed to, but you know, just crouching and looked out, and I saw um, soldiers that are dressed like like in sheet, in linen sheet, in white uniforms, mm -hmm. and they were the Russians. They wanted to be concealed from the snow, not be visible, and they uh, they were they were fighting men. Oh gosh! Oh. They were fighting with the Germans, like hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And um, soon, you know, I don't know how many hours later, uh, we were told that uh, we're free, we're liberated. When they caught German soldiers, they put them on a hill of snow, and they had to stand on that hill. And they were frightened, and they were trembling, and they were shaking, and they were not even hungry yet or anything. And, and uh, the Russians said, we're not addressing themselves to me, but to adult survivors, do what you like with them. Here, you can have them. No one touched them. No one. I don't know, I'm still thinking, whether it was because of fear, or because we are more human than they are, or 
we didn't have the strength or what. Anyway, nobody touched them. How did you feel towards those Germans? I wouldn't have killed them. I couldn't have. I didn't have the killer instinct in me, no. I couldn't think about vengeance. All I wanted to do was get well and get out. Uh, I thought somebody else, grown-ups, soldiers, will take care of this. This song is by Hannah Senesch, who was born in Hungary in 1921. When she was 18, she immigrated to Palestine to get away from anti-Semitism. But then she volunteered to return to Europe in 1944 and was captured, tortured and shot in Hungary by the Nazis. It took six years for her body to be returned to Israel. The cold and the hunger tormented us more and more every day. We became moving corpses, exactly like those we met when we arrived. Every day there were piles of bodies by the barracks. From morning till night, the smoke didn't stop. Autumn arrived, and with it, the rains and the cold. We knew that we would not be able to withstand the snow that would come, and that we would die of the frost one by one, like flies. Entering the camp completely changed people's life. Those who weren't sent to the gas chambers became inmates, nothing but a number, living in constant fear of selection. Many of them could not withstand their unbearable physical and emotional conditions. Many of them perished in the camp. There was no place to escape the cold. We slept in our clothes, and sometimes in our shoes. The worst moment, though, was waking. It demanded the same decision every morning. I had to choose whether to fight or give in. So what made it possible for some to bear the horrifying emotional and physical conditions? What made it possible for them to live in the shadow of death? We choose to address this significant question through artifacts. These objects are the only remnants from a destroyed world. They take on a symbolic meaning beyond their functionality. The fact that we can see, feel, and touch these artifacts makes us feel as if we're touching history. While imprisoned in Auschwitz, Janka Brezhnitz traded a full day's ration of bread for this comb. She kept it throughout the war and ever since. Yanka could not shower. She didn't have any clean clothes. But she was clinging to this comb. Clinging to the comb meant she was still a woman. Part of the process of demonization, all personal belongings were taken away from the inmates. Most of them were left with nothing. Holding on to anything personal in the camp meant endangering life. Those who chose to hold on 
to a personal artifact did it because it meant that they were keeping their dignity, that they were maintaining their identity, that they were hanging on to who they were. Without a sense of meaning, it was very difficult to survive in a world of chaos. We are here to tell the story of this beautiful set of candlesticks that were lit to bring in Shabbat in the warm, loving home of my late father, Alex Rosowski, as he was growing up. These candlesticks sticks are symbolic of the richness of Jewish life enjoyed by the Rosowski family and their community that was near Bartol in Hungary. As the occupation of Budapest by the Nazis became a reality, Moshe decided to bury the most precious artifacts owned by the family. He asked a non-Jewish friend to come and live in the house if the Jews of the town were rounded up. And in fact, that is what happened. Back to the candlesticks and the other precious religious items that were retrieved from their hiding place by Alex's only surviving sister, his eldest sister, Tsunzi. She managed she managed to return home after being liberated from a death march by members of the Russian army. Upon Sunsi's return, her parents' house and all its contents were returned to her. Eventually, Alex, his fiancée Judy, and his sister Tsunzi received entry papers enabling them to travel to Australia and start their new life. They brought very little with them, but the most important items were the candlesticks that had survived the Holocaust, secretly buried. The candlesticks used on my family's, on my family's Shabbat table bring light and hope for a better future. Hello. Liberation was a bittersweet time for those who remained alive. As happy as they may have been to see the end of their harsh incarceration, too much of the survivors' world had been destroyed to truly rejoice. Once the prisoners had been freed, the search for family members began. Many of those searching for loved ones were unsuccessful in finding any relatives. Eva Braun, who survived at Auschwitz and was liberated at Salzwedel, recalls. But after it sank in, the freedom, I realized that where I was hoping the whole time that I will see my father and maybe hope beyond hope my mother, or two, I knew that this is not a realistic hope. Most of the survivors had to fight so hard just to stay alive that they didn't have the capacity or the ability to confront the fates of their loved ones. Up until liberation, many had expended all their energy on surviving from minute to minute. Now they realized that their entire families were gone. Their lives would never be the same. While the rest of the world was counting the dead, the Jews were counting the living. When I was elated by the freedom, there was tremendous fear. Who will I find? How will we, we survived this, but we have to go back to civilization. How, how will we react in a normal world again? We are here two young girls without anything. We were afraid we will have nobody. And we needed we needed somebody that could spoil us, that could take care of us. We have to make a future for ourselves, and how will we make that uh, future? Oh, oh, oh.
מי נשאר, מי עבר, מי עודנו. מה שהיינו פעם מזמן. מה עוד מביא אותי תמיד אל אותה ילדות נשכחת. עוד שנה כבר למדנו מי אני, מי אתה כבר איבדנו מה שהיינו פעם מזמן מה עוד מביא אותי תמיד אל אותה ילדות נשכחת אולי זה רק הלב שמתרגש, שביל בגן עצובי. אבא כאן, אמא שם, כאן נשארתי. מה שהייתי פעם מזמן. מה עוד מביא אותי תמיד אל אותה ילדות? מה עוד מביא אותי תמיד אל אותה ילדות נשכחת. create new families, and contribute to the societies of which they became a part. Despite the unfathomable loss and tragedy, they undertook the decision to return to life. My very clear um, view of freedom and liberation came that morning when I stood in this doorway of that abandoned factory. And I saw a car coming down the hill. And the reality of that came when I saw the white star on its hood and not the swastika. And there were two men in that car. One jumped out. I saw some skeletal figures uh, uh, trying to, to get some water from a hand pump. But over on the other side, uh, uh, leaning uh, next to the end, against the wall next to the entrance of the building I saw a girl standing and, and I decided to go walk up to her. I remember that aura of, of that awe, of, of, of the disbelief in daylight to really see someone who fought for our freedom, for my ideals. And uh, he looked like, like God to me. And I asked her in German and in English whether she spoke either language, and she answered me in, in German. And I, uh, I knew what I had to say. And I said to him, we are Jewish, you know, for a very long time. At least to me it seemed very long. But he didn't answer me. And then his own voice betrayed his emotion. He was wearing dark glasses. I couldn't see his eyes. He said, so am I. asked uh, about her companions. He said, may I see the other ladies? A form of address we hadn't heard for six years. I told him that most of the girls were inside, they were too ill to walk. And he said to me, won't you come with me? I didn't know what he meant. So he, he held the door open for me and let me proceed him. 
was the moment of restoration of, of humanity, of humaneness, of dignity, of freedom. We went inside the factory. Uh, it was an indescribable scene. Uh, there were women scattered over the floor on scraps of straw, uh, some, some of them quite obviously with a mark of death on their faces. I took him to see my friends. The girl who was my guide uh, made sort of a sweeping gesture over this scene of devastation and said the following words. Noble be man, merciful and good. And I could hardly believe that she was able to summon a poem by the German poet Goethe, which was called, is called, The Divine uh, at such a moment. And there was nothing that she could have said that would have underscored the grim irony of the situation better than, than what she did. And his first young American of Liberation Day is now my husband. He opened not only the door for me, but the door to my life and my future. Tragically, many of our students, relatives, and family members perished in the Holocaust. We will now screen the honor roll with their names and many, many other victims' names recorded on it. survivor of Brussels, Belgium, to light a candle. I'm lighting this candle on behalf of the Scopus family in memory of six million Jews who were murdered during World War II. Amongst them, my own two grandmothers, many uncles and aunts and little cousins, all of whom I never knew. We call upon our grandmother, Nina Bassett, who is a survivor of the Lvov ghetto to light a candle. Zahor, remember the millions we have lost. And Zahor, remember that you, every one of you, is our hope, and you are also the triumph of our survival. Please rise for El Malay Rahamim and Kaddish. El Malay Rahamim, Dayan Almanat for Abeyatomim, Amna Kachashev to Tapek Ladam Yisrael Shinishpat Kamayim. I'm <laughs> Amen. <laughs> 
ויברו עמי. יהי שמי רבה מברך לעולם עליון מי עומיה. יתברך, ישתבח, יתפאר, יתרומם, יתנשא. יתתר, יתלה, יתלה, שמי קודשו דרכו. ואלו מכל ברכתה ושירתה, תושבחתה ונחמתה. אברהם ואלמד יברו עמי. יהי שלמה רבה מן שמי הרוחיים עלינו ועל כל ישראל יברו עמי. עושה שלום במרומה, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ואף על ישראל, ויברו אמן. The Partisan Song was written by Hirsch Glick. He wrote a great number of poems and songs, only a few of which survived through friends who hid them. In 1943, when news of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising reached the Vilna Ghetto, Hirsch Glick wrote the following song, Zogonisht Kain, Never Say. Through this song, Hirsch Glick became not only a legend, but also a symbol of faith and spiritual defiance. Hirsch Glick did not survive the war, but his song lives on in the heart and minds of the Jewish people. His song has become an anthem and is sung at Holocaust commemorations throughout the world. Please rise for the singing of the partisan song, followed by Hatifa. Oh, mm-hmm. 